other side, what the kind of introduction. Uh, I'm flattered to be here. Uh, I'm much older than probably everyone in the room. But uh, I started out here at Brockport. And uh, I'm going to have some take home messages or some models in the slide. And I'm going to begin by. If I'm any kind of a success, and I don't think I'm an overwhelming success, there were much better uh, men, uh, there were much better teachers, much better coaches. But uh, if I had any success, it was because I was surrounded by positive people, and they did not have one knack, one needle of negativity. Surround yourself with good people. Second of all, set realistic but challenging goals. Don't be satisfied with what you've accomplished. Push the envelope. It's what I call pushing the envelope. And third, believe in yourself. Uh, some of our take-home messages are the, are the same. Uh, network, network, network. And I'll bring that up in a minute. Where do I come from? I'm from Albany, New York. So that can, but that doesn't account for the accent. Uh, both, my, <laughs> both my parents are immigrated from Germany. My, and my parents were old enough to be my grandparents were when I was born. So my father immigrated uh, after World War I. And he was a uh, structural and ornamental iron. He had a grade school education, but he, valued, he, he knew the value of education. My mother, was a, she immigrated after World War II. Uh, she, was, she complimented my father. When my father was stoic in a bit of a hard part, uh, my mother was, loved, was a very loving woman, and she was very kind. And one, that's one thing, be kind to people. Where did it all begin? Well, <laughs> see that little guy there? That's me. Uh, that's the only slide you're going to see. Uh, what, what point, why did I go into running? Well, let me tell you a little bit about my sister. My sister was uh, two years older. She was a grade school valedictorian. Her high school valedictorian, multilingual by ninth grade, full scholarships to the best academic institutions, MIT, our University of Chicago, first female math major at RPI. God, did I get tired of being compared to her. <laughs> I was a boy, all boy. What the, I like going out in the woods, exploring, going fishing, and uh, uh, playing with my friends. But I did one bet. One, I snuck into her room, and I took her high school yearbook. And I, I saw that track and field and cross country were revered sports in her high school. So in my high school, I decided, hey, I'm a freshman. I'm going out for cross country. I was the 14th man on a 14-man team, <laughs> last guy, uh, and they had a special club. You'll never guess what it was called. The Beat by Baylon Club, and it had a tiny, a tiny membership in my freshman year. Maybe two people, it was small. But anyway, I practiced like the Dickens in the summer between my freshman and sophomore year. And, you know, I was a runt, and I was slow to develop, but I got varsity letters my sophomore year. And you know what I got? I got bad disease. Running on the brain. I thought I was going to be the next world record holder. Not a way. No way. I didn't run the first half of my junior year. Why? I flunked. Regents, exams, and math 10 and Latin. So my running privileges were taken away by my father. And guess what happened? My grades 
improved tremendously. So I got to run for the rest of my high school career, which was, uh, I was still a fair to me mediocre runner at best. I had a goal. I wanted to be a high school gym teacher and track coach. So I knew because of my overall academic performance, I, Springfield was, was, was the number one PE school in the nation back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and maybe even the 70s. But they, they wouldn't take me. I didn't even apply. So I said, I'll apply to two state schools, Cortland and Brockport. Cortland didn't want anything to do with me either. <laughs> so I ended up at Brockport. And I never, one thing happened in February of 1970. I tracked, for the first time, I traveled west of Utica and visited Brockport. And that was something else. <laughs> Believe it or not, there is life after high school. <laughs> oh, I met my first life mentor, Jim, Jim Fulton, for whom the natatorium is named after. And he was, a, he was a nationally renowned swimming coach. Or arguably, he was a better cross-country coach. And he always asked me, hey, Tom, how's it going? How's it going? Oh, it's going OK. Look at the two models. College is about academics, first and foremost. And his second model, okay, show the model so you can see it. <laughs> and also, uh, he never, in, in running, he never spreads <coughs> winning. He just said, do your best to your capabilities. Well, maybe in running, I tried hard. But in academics, first three semesters, 1.6. You gotta try hard to get a 1.6. <laughs> three C's, two D's. Second semester, I pulled an astronomical 2.25. And I was still eligible to compete. And he always asked, how's it going, Tom? Doing great. <laughs> Third semester. I needed a 2 0, 1 9 6, and they booted me out. They, they sugar coated it. You may not register for classes for two semesters. I flunked out. I flunked out. And 1972 was a year of hell because I moved back to live with my parents. <laughs> and what happened? <laughs> what happened? My father retired, and he was always around the house. And I said, I can't do this. So what did I do? I went to the selective service to, uh, in, uh, to enlist in the army. What do you think happened? Any guesses? <laughs> I fucked again! <laughs> I fucked again! With directed lenses. I, I have perfect eyesight. 2020, without corrective lenses, I'm blind, 2200. And I won't go into the story where I lost my glasses in the race. But anyway, in that year, I did not want to be around the house. So I worked around my parents' house. So I worked three jobs. I threw mail sacks in the, in the post office from midnight till 8.30 in the morning. I was a utility man at Howard Johnson's, the home of 28 flavors for whole. Uh, in other words, I was a dishwasher. And I could go down the road to the local cemetery and dig grapes. But there was one person who was the life changer, was the game changer. Jim Colby. Uh, Jim Colby was a gifted athlete. And he often blamed himself for, for my uh, dismissal. We ran together. We ate in the dining hall together. Uh, we participated in some extracurricular extra -curricular activities together. <laughs> but Jim did one thing. 
he put time aside for study. And me? No, I went to the dorm, and the dorm looked uh, that movie Animal House, that was calm compared <laughs> to, the, to the dorms back in the 1970s. But one, I, was, I said, I'm going back to Brockport. And I pulled 12, sem I pulled 12 semester hours of A at Hudson Valley Community College and got readmitted. I learned a couple of things. Self-assessment and constant self-assessment and reevaluation of myself. Time management skills. I can't believe I worked all those jobs and still I was a, a full-time student, night student that is, and look at, look at what I did that first day at Brockport. I assumed total responsibility for my flunking out and uh, I wanted to get away from home because my father was appalled and disgusted with me. Let's, let's move on. <laughs> okay. More than a coach, you'll probably know this guy, Don Murray, wrestling coach. He's not only, he was not only, he's not only a great coach, won NCAA Division three, five, three, over three, different decades, five times NCAA ch uh, team champions, but he was an ex, he was not an excellent teacher, he was an outstanding teacher, and I remember his classes, and I, he wanted every person in his uh, class, if you would enter a K-12 through uh, setting, that you could teach a wrestling unit, and <laughs> I could teach a wrestling unit with no problems. And both these guys, and I'll discuss it with her in a minute, as coaches and faculty members, they wanted their athletes or student athletes to be better than they were. And that's how the world becomes a better place. I, and uh, I'll show you some examples in a minute. Ed Winrow was my second cross country coach and track coach. And Ed was an outstanding athlete. Two-time All-American uh, for Buffalo, Buffalo State. And that was when divisions two and three were combined. They called the college division. He had three United, he had three United States records post-collegiately. And probably his biggest claims was he was third Olympic alternate in the 1968 Olympic Games, and he was first Pan Am game alternate in 1967. And he wanted his athletes and his students to be better. He taught a fantastic uh, sports medicine class. Okay, well, I graduated from Brockport, and that was just the beginning of an exciting, exciting time. It's a long way there, but a long way to where I'm going. What happened after Brockport? Uh, I decided to go, uh, both Mr. Fulton and uh, Ed Winrow said Ball State uh, Teachers College, which is now Ball State University, is a fantastic place. My goal was then uh, to uh, to get uh, 30 more semester hours or 45 more quarter hours to get my pregnant teacher certification. But I worked with uh, Ed Winrow's former uh, mentor, David Costo. David Costo was at that time, for about three, uh, three uh, decades, he was the best human exercise sport physiologist in the world. And he had, a, that lab had a unique environment. And uh, he stressed hands on, use your head for more than a hat rack. Get involved, if you see someone <laughs> doing something, get involved, just don't stand there and look. And it was a great environment. And 
Then I had a goal. I wanted to find out what makes me so damn slow and other people so damn fast. I never was an outstanding runner. Oh, sure, I had some uh, memorable performances, but I really taught, uh, I, I thought I was just a mediocre runner. A little bit more about that. So, another guy, Ed Coyle, he was another graduate student. And right now, to this day, he's probably the best human performance exercise physiologist in the United States, if not the world. He's interested in performance. Uh, he was associated with Lance Armstrong at one time before all that doping went on. <laughs> but again, here's Ed Coyle. The, the facilities at Ball State were fantastic. And I remember I went out there in uh, during spring break of my senior year, and that's where John Underwood, who still holds the uh, school record here at Brockport, he ran his first steeplechase there. And I was looking at the uh, facilities. The facilities were outstanding, but more importantly, it was the people in the lab and the atmosphere that uh, Costo orchestrated. We had, visit we had visitors coming in constantly. We had world-class athletes coming in constantly being, being tested. It was a fantastic place to be, and I grew immensely. And I did find out why I was so damn slow, and those other guys were so damn fast. Okay. Uh, again, fortune, fortune presented itself, and I took advantage of it. Uh, I, I completed my master's in less than a year, 11 months, and I knew something about distance running, and they needed an assistant track coach at Mankato, which is a Division two division school. And if you take a look at the school records, you can see these records are, some of them are world-class performances, like a 7-6 high jump. 22, a 22, a 26 to long term. And even uh, one of the older, oldest records, uh, let's see, one of the oldest records was, uh, uh, well, 149, uh, 800 meter. That is one record that was broken last year. But, let me see, there are two records that are pretty darn old. Doug Keller, in the 5,000 meters, and Joe Cranks in the 10,000 meters. And I was very, very fortunate to coach them. And those records still hold after more than 40 years. Now, let's push the envelope. And uh, there was that important word that was brought up. Build, build relationships, network. I loved when when she said that. I just loved it. That is a message. You build relationships, and some of those relationships last forever. Now, at Brockport, I know there's been a couple Olympians from Brockport. Oh, let me point the, ah, the one as well as the story. Three athletes from Brockport qualified for the Olympic trials. John Underwood, Rick Saxton, and Mark Skinkel. And I should say that three athletes from the teams I coach also qualified for the Olympic trials. Lee Anderson, Joe Kreutz, and Doug, Doug Keller. But you'll say, well, where's the networking, okay? John, after he graduated here in 1978, he wanted to push the envelope. He wanted to see how good he could be. Is he simply going to be an NCAA All-American? You know, set your goals high and grab, grab the goal. He moved out to Oregon right after he graduated from Rockwood, Eugene, Oregon. One of my former athletes, Joel Kreutz, he wanted also to qualify for the Olympic trials. So what did he do? He and his wife moved out to Eugene. And John? 
and his wife would put up with Joe and his wife until they found jobs. And then another Brockport athlete followed, Rick Saxton, who would have the six who still has a six mile record for Brockport. And again, John put them up. And he did he didn't know Joe before he moved out, but I said, hey, I coach John, I coach Joe, they synergize, and then another Brockport athlete came. Build relationships and build important, lasting relationships. And they helped out one another, because I'll tell you what, Joe Kreutz and Rick Saxton qualified for the Olympic trials about, oh, maybe seven months after they moved out. And John hit the skittles. And, but what did they do? They encouraged John. And uh, in, this, in the next spring, he qualified him for the Olympics. Okay. Oh boy. Ride, ever hear the song Ride My Seesaw? <laughs> well, I guess everyone's uh, less than 60 years old. Hootie <laughs> Blues, Ride My Seesaw. But anyway, uh, that stay at Mankato was so fulfilling. It was fulfilling. So uh, I wanted to go on for a PhD. I went to Mankato because they gave me a glorified uh, assistantship. I was assistant track coach at Mankato, but the athletic director liked me, and he gave me a room in the dorm and a meal ticket. So I, I was set. I was set. I, so I started my PhD at Toledo because I reset my goal. I wanted to be a exercise physiologist in a university setting. And I got along great at the University of Toledo. Grades were fantastic. Uh, I was on a roll. And I, I started that role at Ball State, went to Mankato, and I was on a roll at the University of Toledo. But then my academic advisor, he transferred to Purdue, and I made a, another mistake. I should have visited. Whenever you're thinking of going someplace, to a university or a life setting, you should visit it. I didn't visit, I didn't visit Purdue, but I thought, wow, if I get a, a degree from a Big Ten school, it's going to be much better than getting a degree from Toledo. And that was my big mistake. I went to Purdue, and I couldn't even file a plan of study. So in other words, a plan for graduation. It was a, uh, I looked at the, at the laboratory, and it looked like Dr. Frankenstein's <laughs> laboratory. There was dust, no lab benches, the equipment was archaic. So, what happened then was I wanted I made lemon lemonade out of lemons. <laughs> if anyone can guess who that is, uh, I don't know. I think out for dinner. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. You. No. Uh -uh. <laughs> that was Fred Wilt. He was a uh, two-time uh, Olympian, and he was the. Uh, Yes, it was Fred Will. The name says so. But anyway, he was a women's track coach at Purdue. And he was a two-time Olympian. He won the Sullivan Award. That, that award is given to the most outstanding amateur, amateur athlete, all sports wrestling, and any athlete, any amateur sport. And it was such a rich experience because uh, my academics or filing a plan of study was impossible. I wanted to I wanted to take a biomedical engineering class, and you know what they said to me? Uh, there's a two year waiting list. <coughs> and then after a year, I said uh, I like to register for the class, and they said, Oh, that's only open to biomedical engineering majors. 
I tried to sign up for uh, advanced, I did sign up for advanced biochemistry class, and I walked into the class, and the, guy, the professor goes, oh, I haven't seen you, because he had his four advisors, or advisees, graduate students there. I go, oh, my name's Tom Balon. He goes, what department are you from? And I was honest, physical education, and he laughed at me. And anyone who laughs at me, they better get ready for a fight. <laughs> but I didn't fight him. I studied more for two-hour class than I did for any six-hour class. And uh, one of his graduate students heard me say, oh, I'm a physical education major. And she said under her breath, where's his basketball? That incited me. And I, I pulled an A in this class. So I met him after the next semester and he goes, oh, we have another class coming up and you did rather well. And I go, yeah, I did okay, but your, cha your class wasn't challenging. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to push it in the space because you gotta fight and you gotta believe in yourself. You gotta believe in yourself. If you don't, you might as well give up, okay? So Fred Will, I spent seven Friday evenings with him and his wife, he and his wife and family. We had dinner together, and then we talked track and field for seven Friday nights after dinner, for four hours. And he wrote probably 16 books on track and field. And he was a work, he traveled around the world as a world-class athlete. He went to two Olympic Games, and I was a big benefactor. How much did he learn from me? Well, I don't know. <laughs> but you give and take. Okay. So, Purdue didn't work out for me. What did I do? I transferred back to Toledo. And I was going through academic advisors left and right. I had another advisor, and he decided to transfer to LSU Medical Center. <laughs> and I was just about ready to give up on my my uh, PhD, but I did. I sat down and I planned what I was going to do. So what happened was I went, uh, oops, that's not right. <laughs> okay. There was a medical college of Ohio that was loosely affiliated with the University of Toledo. So what I did was I was interested, I was doing uh, studies on rats and exercise and looking at a look at a particular uh, change in the enzyme following acute and chronic exercise and I did my rat running up at University of Toledo and my biochemical analysis at the Medical College of Ohio at Toledo and I thought my, my pocket uh, I was picking up cans to pay for it but I was awarded a fellowship, and things worked out. I hate to say this, but about 25 years later, the Medical College of Ohio at Toledo morphed into the University of Toledo, and then I wouldn't have had to pay for uh, tuition at the medical school. I picked up med uh, my degrees in physical education. I picked up minors in medical physiology and biochemistry. Okay. Oh, gosh, yes. Read back what it says. This is to certify that Tom Baylon is the fastest human on Earth. It says that, doesn't it? Yeah, okay. Was I the fastest human on Earth? No, no. But I, I faced a, a crossroads. And it was, I was going to pursue a postdoctoral fellowship. And I've already been in college for 13 years. I started in 1970. I got my PhD in 1983. But I realized that I was at the end of my improvement. I improved tremendously because I gave 13 years in, oh, well, 13 years of college, actually uh, plus four in the high school. I was running for 17 years. When I was a freshman in high school, I ran a six-minute mile, and lots of people can run a six-minute mile. Uh, 18, 17 years later, I could run 26 
six minute miles back to back. I ran a 237 marathon. Respectable, but I wasn't a world class runner. And I realized that my improvement was, I was leveling out. But we take our victories when and where you can get them. Uh, I got that uh, certificate back in um, uh, at some race, and that was the race course up and down the hills in Michigan City, uh, Michigan City, Indiana. And those were hills, six miles of hills in the sand. I, I was, I retired, but I also ran three ultra marathons. Uh, ranging from uh, 10 hours in length to uh, 50 miles. I did a postdoc. I decided to do a postdoc. And everyone was doing postdocs under one particular guy, I won't mention his name, at, uh, Boston, uh, at Washington University at St. Louis. But I decided to go a different route. I went to Boston University from 1983 to 1986 under Neil Ruderman. Neil Ruderman had his MD degree at age 17. Well, he did, he did his residency, and he loved research, but he was a clinician, but he loved research so much, he did get his DPHIL. Does anyone know where you can get your DPHIL from? Any guess, come on. Please. You won't get it from Hudson Valley. Come on. Give me a guess. Yes. Go ahead. Toledo. Toledo, no. He got it from Oxford. And he got it from Oxford under a Nobel Prize winner, Sir Hans Krebs of the Krebs Cycle. And I realized he had some models too. He said, We'll, we'll accept your strengths and rectify your weaknesses. Did I have any strengths? The strength was I put all my energy that I used to put into running, into working in the lab. And well, I should say, we'll, uh, we'll work you to death and rectify your weaknesses. Uh, I had a let's say, a com communication. I wasn't an el I'll never be an elegant speaker. Maybe I can entertain, but uh, I'll never be an elegant speaker, but I learned how to write. And he said, create your niche. And I, I published a series of three studies dealing on uh, post-exercise thermogenesis. The increase in oxygen consumption that is present after you stop exercising. And that was my niche. And uh, it was a good niche, but it was short lived. I took my first faculty position at University of Iowa. And these are two students. Uh, one was my first graduate student, Craig Well. And he's done remarkably well. Uh, He's an endowed professor in the Department of Kinesiology at, 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 at Iowa State University and conducts research on the assessment and promotion of physical activity and exercise. The other one, Jeff Horwitz, he's a full professor already at uh, University of Michigan, Big Ten School. And they're both in, uh, in NAC Fellows, that's National Academy of Kinesiology. They stayed in the study of exercise. And now I would say that they've done so much uh, that I almost stand in their shadows. I wanted to, to produce students who were better than, than I was. I produced runners at Mankato who uh, were faster than I was. And I wanted to produce students. And next slide. And some of my students, they got the degrees in exercise science, but they morphed into pretty good physicians. All three of these are former undergraduate students, undergraduate students, advisees. They decided to, produce, to uh, pursue medicine, and all three of them are renowned 
on a national level in different areas. Anatomical path uh, pathologist, a dermatologist, and an ophthalmologist. And uh, Katie, well, her maiden name was Katie Ketoff. She she was uh, she confused me. <laughs> she confused me, but it was confusion in a very nice sense. She came to me after taking my class, and she said, oh, goes, I want to do my senior project in your laboratory. So we talked about it, and uh, she said, I want to begin it as a junior. I don't want to wait till my senior year, because I'm, I'm going to be quite busy in my junior year. So I go, fine. And I passed by, I passed by the swimming pool. Well, the first time I met her, she had green hair. And I said, I, I couldn't care less whether she had green hair or red hair. I accept all students. I don't care whether they're black, white, any. I just quite like to deal with students. But she had green hair. And I thought, well, maybe she died it for uh, St. Patrick's Day. You know, maybe she met Dr. Frankenstein. I don't know. I went by the pool. And she spent up to four hours a day in the swimming pool training year round. And why would she have green hair? Anyone with a swimming background? Chlorine. Chlorine. Cool. And chlorine and Chlorine. Copper. Copper interacts with chlorine and it'll turn uh, your hair green. Anyway, she turned out not only she was a two-time All-American Division I diver, and I, I wouldn't want to dive off those uh, my boards. Anyway, she was a great she was a great asset to the lab, and not only did I have undergraduate uh, uh, people students in my lab, but also I had my two bright hands. Julie Ort was the first uh, technician that I hired. And I hired her because she was organized and she was the backbone of the lab. She promoted a contagiously positive atmosphere. And what did I say about negativity? No room for negativity. Think positive, think big. And uh, then there was Arnie Jasmine. And he was, a, he was a heck of a guy and he was different. He worked for me for 11 years, and he started out as a work-study dishwasher. And those dishes were clean, I'll tell you, he was, he was a hell of a dishwasher. But then he wanted to get hands-on experience, so he started making buffers. He performed simple assays or measurements. And then he was my right hand when I was doing surgery, because sometimes you just need an extra hand to tie it tie a knot. And one thing I didn't like about Barney was he was about 6'4 and about 260 pounds. And he just, you know, when I had to tie the knot, I, 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 I didn't have any room. But he worked for me as a dishwasher. He moved to the next place with me. And that was, that was a great place. Uh, uh, I'll break this up for a minute. I'll move on to my next place, but I want to give acknowledgement to two of these people. These were my scientific colleagues. And again, I stand in their shadows. Jeff Kesson, uh, one of the best uh, molecular biologists in the world of uh, diabetes, and Alan Mark, who received uh, the highest award by the American, Di American uh, Heart, Heart Association for his contributions in hypertension. They were te te those two guys were team, they were my teammates, they were my collaborators. Well, you, you would say, well, if those guys are world class, what did you, you know, how was you a teammate of theirs? I had something to offer. And it's like a relay race. If you have a distance medley race, there's a three quarter mile, a half mile, a quarter mile and a mile. And for the areas of research, for Jeff, he never touched an animal in his life. And I had six years of animal surgical experience. Alan Mark was a, uh, 
He was looking at microneurography uh, and muscle sympathetic nerve activity, but he didn't know how to do an insulin glucose clamp, which is a procedure that animals physiologists often do. But I know I knew how to do it in humans by getting involved on an observational basis at my previous institution. Yoko Yamaguchi, likewise, she's a molecular biologist, and she taught me how to do molecular biology, and I taught her lab how to do animal surgery. But Yoko was great, because she started out as a junior postdoc, and that's the lowest you can do after you get your PhD. But Yoko broke through glass ceilings. She busted butt. She didn't want to be a. She, she didn't let her gender or her race hold her back at all. She broke glass ceilings, that's for sure. They didn't exist for her. And she taught me about the politics of the ne next place where I was kind of going. Okay? Again, take home message. Have something to contribute in order to make a team effort. And then everyone benefits. Not just them, you also benefit. I went to City of Hope Medical Center, and that's about four exits from the Rose Bowl in Duarte, California, suburb of Los Angeles. Would anyone know what that is on the left hand of that picture? It's the San Gabriel River. Uh, it, uh, California experienced a drought for, what, two, two decades? I, I, I wonder what that was, but there was supposed to be a river there, and there wasn't. But anyway, remember I said for the PhD, count on change, wherever you are, nothing stays stagnant. Look at this campus. Half these buildings, well, more than half these buildings didn't exist. Tuttle North was just being built uh, my first year here, okay? But again, it was a great institution. My appointments changed from City of Hope and National Medical Center to the Beckman Research Institute at City of Hope. Why? Because I was bringing in uh, millions of dollars of grant money. City of Hope is known, it's an NCI designated cancer research institute, National Cancer Institute designated center. And the big focus at City of Hope was, uh, was cancer. And Yoko being my, she was sort of a mentor for me. She told me about the politics and she goes, diabetes is just a supporting department. Diabetes is, is a little department. So it would be to your advantage to uh, get involved in cancer. And I, I, I uh, listened to her, and within, by, by the time I left, what happened was I had two grants dealing with uh, breast cancer. And, uh, and that was funded by the Department of Defense and the uh, state of California. You know what the state of California does to the tobacco taxes, they use it for breast cancer research. And the Department of Defense, you say, Department of Defense and breast cancer? Well, there's women in the, in the, in the armed forces, correct? And they move a certain percentage of their money into breast cancer. Smart move by the Department of Defense because uh, uh, other other government institutions, uh, the cancer, cancer is going to be around for a while, and it's good that they made that investment. Okay, uh, I'm almost done, and yeah, I thought I was going to talk for four and a half hours, but now I'm, I'm cutting it short. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I really wanted to talk for six hours because I had to, I had to talk to you about fifty years. But anyway. Uh, City of Hope was a great place, but what did, on the slide that I showed Jim Colby, what did I say? What did I, assume? when I flunked out, what did I assume? 
total responsibility for my actions. And Cynthia Hope edged on that because I was off campus and I had a minus 80 freezer with all my samples stored for the last 16 years. And the freezer broke down. But I had two alarms on the freezer and the alarms didn't go off. So I lost 16 or 18 years of research in one night. And what was I supposed to do? Start over again? I lost my work product. Investigators sent me tissue samples. I exchanged tissue samples. So my collaborators uh, lost something too. And the institution did not assume responsibility. But uh, it took me three years for City of Hope to assume responsibility. And things turned out rather well. Uh, you can ask me all after the talk uh, how, did, how, how it worked out. So I assume it went back rather well. Uh, four slides left. I created a niche, and that was, I. I found out nitric oxide, you've probably heard of it. It's gas. It, it, some people think it's a laughing gas, but the exercising muscle produces lack, uh, nitric oxide, and that's responsible for a number of physiological processes. processes. And other investigators, uh, uh, you'll see it was an invited editorial of a leading journal, and also the American College of Sports Medicine asked me to write a perspective on that. And it moved my career ahead, but I didn't have any of my samples left. I spent four years at Glaxo. Glaxo, and I, during my stay at City of Hope, I interacted. I was funded uh, for over a million dollars by different pharmaceutical companies. For, for work with exercise and, uh, and nitric oxide. And Glaxo, you talk about change, that was a unique and effort. Everything changes at Rock, at change at Glaxo. But in an academic setting, you own, you own, you own your research. In industry, you don't own anything. They own it. When I wrote a patent for uh, at City of Hope, I got royalties. I didn't get any royalties when I worked for Glaxo. Why? They own everything. And uh, they changed their research model. And over the course of uh, my stay there, you can see they, they were paid over, they paid over $10, $10 billion. It says 9.8. But they paid billions of dollars for their unethical, uh, for their unethical uh, procedures, and this is this you can find that on the web. I'm closing now, pretty quick. Okay, so whoa. So what happened was you can see I, I worked at different places. X and Exercise always seemed to be a theme. Post-exercise, post-exercise, exercise and biochemical uh, messengers. And after I uh, left back, so I took a little bit of a, of a break, and I went back as a visiting professor to where I was, uh, where I did my postdoctoral fellowship. And the vice president calls me in, and she says, "We have a problem." And I said, don't make my, your problem my problem. And she goes, it is your problem, but you're going to benefit by it. And I go, how? She goes, the department chair of endocrinology left. And I said, oh, that's not good. He went to a, he went to a very good institution, Harvard. And I go, well, I'm not department chair material, that's for sure. I'm a, I'm a scientist. And uh, she says, we still have a problem. Or why he took his whole entourage with him, 20 more faculty members. So it left the department and the department, it, it left the Department of Endocrinology 
and the division of medicine in big problems. And she goes, we have projects going on, and we need someone to run two cores. The first one was a metabolic phenotyping core. So what we can do is we can take a look at, we can put people of uh, mice or rats or chickens into a echo NMR, and we can determine their body composition. There were a large number of studies, nutritional intervention studies. So I, I knew how to operate that, and they wanted to look at exercise performance. Does a drug uh, increase or decrease their endurance? I ran a lot of rats, okay? And so I was appointed the uh, metabolic phenotyping core. A couple of weeks later, uh, an investigator received a large grant, and he resigned from running the in vivo imaging system. And if you know how to operate this properly, you can look at tumor growth and proliferation. You can see how the tumor metastasis uh, go, starts, it grows in a tissue, and then it jumps to another tissue. Uh, she could make everything a win-win situation. So, in the last six years that I spent at, uh, at Boston University, I was using this equipment for some non-conventional studies, but they got published in uh, what I would call upper tier journals. One thing we did was we looked at number six, concussion, microvascular injury, and early pathology in young athletes after impact head injury. So in other words, we had eight, eight young athletes. They were all uh, between, uh, I believe it was nine and 12 years of age, and they were soccer players. And we noted that those athletes, those young athletes, we're having concussions, almost concussions, similar to a, a boxer. And you said, well, how can you look at that? Well, unfortunately, from those athletes, some of them committed suicide, some of them committed drug overdoses, under 14 years of age. But we noted that those pathologies, the near concussions of those young athletes were similar to uh, impact concussions from a mouse animal model. So, uh, a concussion model where the mouse was in a chamber and all of a sudden there was a blast next to the chamber, similar to a, a soldier and a hand grenade or a mortar shell uh, landing near them. So again, of all these studies, I only wanted to include myself as a co-author. I was asked to co-author all these articles. But I wanted to give the younger investigators a chance. Why put my name on it? I simply was providing a service for them. So I had just included, um, my name was only included, in, I only decided to include my name on one study, and I took a look at the effects of uh, cooking on the gut microbiome. I've talked enough. But I'm going to answer any questions that you might have. Questions? No questions? Why not? Come on. Okay. Yes. Talk loud. After going to so many universities, what keeps you coming back to Brockport? Oh, Brockport is where it all started. I, look, I have an allegiance to this school. And it was started out in intercollegiate athletics. I had great men I had great coach. I had great mentors. This is where I began. And I love track and field and cross country. I love I love the athletes that they're all they're a very good bunch of young men and women. And I love competition too. I love people just running, running, throwing, not throwing elbows. I love <laughs> The thrill of competition, there's nothing like the thrill of competition, you know, and there's nothing. I wouldn't trade it for the world. I wouldn't trade, I mean, I'm, 
I'm not, I'm done competing. You're not going to get me more than that without a race. But I love the competition. And there's nothing like it. It's so, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. When I saw the NCAA uh, women, did anyone take a look at, look at Iowa beating South Carolina in the women's basketball game? That was fantastic. I loved it. You know, seeing our uh, Caitlin Clark, uh, she, has, she either scored or assisted on like 38 of uh, Iowa's first 45 points. She took charge and she believed, believe you me, she believed in herself. That's great. I'm all for uh, women's athletics and men's athletics. I'm glad Title IX came across. That was a game changer. And sooner or later, maybe we'll have women's wrestling. I, I love I love athletics, but I like I like uh, I like I like rock court. This is where it started for me. Another question. Are you afraid? Say something about that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, well, the universities that you went to, which one was your favorite? The one I contribute to, probably. That's where it began. I learned a lot. I learned. I learned a lot at Ball State. It was terrific. It got me into exercise physiology more. Now, I learned a lot of science at the other institutions, but Rockport is where it began. And you have to believe that, hey, if this, I flunked out of college, they gave me a second chance. I don't think other places would give me a second chance, but they gave me a chance, and I took full advantage of that opportunity. Yo, I, well, I gotta watch my language. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wasted my first year and a half at Rockport. And that was a nice kick in the butt and slap in the face. <laughs> Take responsibilities for my goofing off and right the ship. And uh, everything worked out well. So, <laughs> another question. You need to go here, Tom. So, uh, what made you slow and made them faster? Well, I blame on my parents. <laughs> <laughs> I blame it's part, it was mainly genetics. I was born with a very, very, uh, a very, very large amount of slow twitch fibers. I did uh, there's a number of women athletes on the team who can run a quarter mile faster. I had, I struggled to break this. 60. My fastest quarter, I think, was 58.2. That's rather benign. But, again, for six minute miles, I put 26 of them back to back. Oh, one other thing. Another take home message. Another take home message. Uh, I stayed with it. I persevered. And for those guys who pushed the envelope and qualified for the Olympic trials, it takes about 10 years to really develop yourself. It they pushed it after, after college. They gave it another couple years. You know, high school four years, college four years, and it, uh, John Underwood pushed it for another six years after he graduated. It takes a, amount, a certain amount of time to develop. They're not gonna happen overnight. Now, if I was 100, if I was a, uh, perhaps a dash man, 100 meter, 200 meter, it's a lot less time. But for distance runners, it takes time. Another question. Come on, Smiley. I see you. Come on, you, you want your fighting at the end of the question. I'm humble, I'm very humble to have been invited. I still like to know who invited me to be a speaker. I'm not a terrific orator. My speaking skills are not great. I hope I send, I, I hope I educate it. I hope I inform. I think I may be entertained. <laughs> and I hope I inspire someone. Move to greatness. Don't settle for mediocrity. And if you're at Brockport, it can be done anywhere. Thanks. Opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> Again, 
on behalf of the history department and the Distinguished Festival Series Committee. Thanks a lot. And